Welcome back to this introductory statistics course and the second installment of our brief series on psychometrics. Today I have something completely different for you, dimension reduction. Remember that last week we discussed the core purpose of psychometrics, which is to measure an underlying latent construct using multiple observed indicators. Very simply put, if we have a data set with multiple variables, each measuring the same thing, how do we put them together? To do so, we essentially have three techniques at our disposal. I will introduce all three of them today, but go in depth on only two of them. The third technique is more specialized and requires a separate course if you want to learn more about it. The first technique we'll cover is principal components analysis. The second technique is exploratory factor analysis. And the third technique is confirmatory factor analysis. Throughout this lecture, assume that we have k items. So if we have three questions measuring extraversion, then k is three. And we have n participants. So if we have 300 participants, then n is 300. The first technique that I want to introduce is principal component analysis. Principal component analysis essentially is a data rotation technique. Imagine that data exists in multiple dimensions. If we have two variables, those variables exist in two dimensional space, X and Y, and we could theoretically rotate the data in those two dimensions in such a way that we maximize the explained variance along one dimension and minimize the explained variance along the other dimension. That is principal component analysis. And we can use it for dimension reduction if it so happens to be that the first dimension or a few of the first dimensions explain the overwhelming majority of the variance in all of the variables. So remember in our two dimensional example, if we rotate the data and then find one dimension explains nearly all of the variance, then we could forget about the second dimension and voila, we've just reduced two dimensions to just one dimension that explains most of the variance in both of them. And by extension, if we have, for example, 10 questions, all measuring participants extraversion, and we rotate those 10 dimensions using principal component analysis and find that just one dimension explains most of the variance in all 10 of the questions, then we could drop nine of the dimensions, keep just one, and voila, we've reduced the dimensionality of the data from 10 dimensions to just one. But remember that principal component analysis just rotates the data. Dropping dimensions is a second step. So if we start with k variables and we rotate them, we still have k components. And those components are linear combinations of the original k variables. So no information is lost, it's only rotated. The second dimension reduction technique I want to introduce is exploratory factor analysis. In contrast to principal component analysis, exploratory factor analysis is a latent variable method. Strictly speaking, that means that we assume that some unobserved latent characteristic of our participants caused their responses to all of our K items. So for example, we might believe that extraversion exists somewhere inside our participants' heads and their level of extraversion causes them to respond more enthusiastically to 10 questions about socializing and partying. Exploratory factor analysis takes the covariance matrix of our K items, so the variances of those items and the covariances between the items, and models that covariance matrix as a function of a fixed number of factors. And we choose how many factors. The reason we call this technique exploratory factor analysis is because all of the items are allowed to load on all of the factors that we specify. So some of the key challenges in exploratory factor analysis are determining how many factors there actually are, figuring out which items are strongly associated with which factors. And if the questionnaire is good, then we would see, for example, that items designed to measure extraversion all load highly on one latent factor, which we could then call extraversion. And other items designed to measure neuroticism load highly on a different factor, which we could then call neuroticism. 
The final technique that I just want you to be aware of is confirmatory factor analysis. Confirmatory factor analysis is similar to exploratory factor analysis, but it's different in one essential way. Whereas exploratory factor analysis allows all of our questions to be associated with all of our latent variables, confirmatory factor analysis assumes a known causal structure. For example, you can say, I know that there must be two latent variables, neuroticism and extroversion, and neuroticism is only allowed to be associated with the questions designed to measure neuroticism, and extroversion is only allowed to be associated with the questions measuring extroversion, and of course neuroticism and extroversion are allowed to be associated, but their questions should be distinct. That's a very highly specified theoretical model, and we use confirmatory factor analysis to test how well our theoretical measurement model fits to the observed data. So in confirmatory factor analysis, we assume that we know how many latent variables there are and that we know which items load on which latent variables. This technique is outside of the scope of this course, but it's important to know that it exists. And also, I think that exploratory factor analysis makes a little bit more sense if you know how it relates to confirmatory factor analysis. So let's go over the key differences between these techniques. If we look at their distinct purposes, then principal component analysis is used for dimension reduction. Exploratory factor analysis explores how different items are associated with different latent constructs. And confirmatory factor analysis tests a theory about which items are related to which latent constructs. If we look at the assumptions of these different techniques, then note that principal component analysis does not assume the existence of latent variables. However, we can drop components from the principal component analysis, and we could say that dropping components assumes that those components are irrelevant or consist of error variants. Exploratory factor analysis assumes that all of the items are caused by a smaller number of latent variables. And confirmatory factor analysis assumes that the items are caused by specific latent variables. Finally, when we look at the interpretation of these three techniques, the components resulting from principal component analysis are just mathematical constructs with no further meaning. They're just the same data rotated in space. Exploratory factor analysis results in factors that represent theoretical latent constructs and confirmatory factor analysis represents known theoretical latent constructs. So we might obtain a factor from exploratory factor analysis and guess that that factor represents extraversion because we see that a lot of extraversion items load highly on it. But in confirmatory factor analysis, we know which factor represents extraversion because we allow only the extraversion items to load onto it. We can also compare these techniques visually with box diagrams. So let's start on the left with a diagram representing principal components analysis. On the left here, we have nine indicator variables. So here we've administered a questionnaire with nine different questions, X1, X2, X3, until X9. Because we just rotate these data in space, what we're left with after the rotation are again nine different variables that represent exactly the same information from the original nine variables but rotated along their different dimensions. And we call those resulting nine variables principal components PC1, PC2, PC3 until PC9. Now each of these principal components is a linear combination of all of the nine items and that's why we see arrows pointing from each of the nine items to each of the nine principal components. But of course, some items can contribute more to one component than to a different one. If we move to exploratory factor analysis in the middle, we still see our nine observed items, X1 until X9. But now we see a different symbol, which is this little circle. And this circle represents what is called a latent variable. We've already seen latent variables in our box diagrams before because the prediction error of linear regression is a latent variable. And indeed what we see here too is that after applying exploratory factor analysis, we have a prediction error for each of our items. 
So this diagram has some similarity to linear regression because every observed indicator has some prediction error and its predictor in this case is another latent variable namely f1 or factor 1. So here we've asked for three factors. So here we've asked for three factors f1, f2 and f3 and we estimate a model that says all of the items are caused by each of those factors. So F1 can have an influence on all nine items, and so can F2, and so can F3. And then what we're hoping to see is that each of the factors will have high loadings on some of the items and low loadings on other items, so that we can straightforwardly interpret each of those factors as one latent construct. So again, what we see here is a model in which from right to left, there is a latent variable F1. That latent variable causes people's responses on the observed indicators, X1 until X9. And of course, it doesn't perfectly cause it. There's also measurement error. Remember the test theory model from last week, where we also assumed that the observed score is a function of the true score, that's the latent variable, plus measurement error, that's epsilon one. And then you see that this exploratory factor analysis model basically represents our test theory model. Finally, we have confirmatory factor analysis on the right, and we see that confirmatory factor analysis is similar to exploratory factor analysis, but simplified, because basically the only difference is that we assume that all of the cross loadings are equal to zero. So factor one is no longer allowed to load on all of the items, it's only allowed to load on items X1 until X3, which were designed to measure it. So you can imagine, for example, that we are measuring personality here, and factor one represents openness, and X1, 2, and 3 are questions designed to measure openness. So the latent variable openness causes people's responses to those questions, but there is some measurement error, epsilon 1, 2, and 3. And then factor two might be conscientiousness and X4, five and six are questions designed to measure conscientiousness. The latent variable conscientiousness causes people's responses to those questions, but with some measurement error, epsilon four, five and six and so forth. Now we're gonna get a little bit deeper into principal component analysis and exploratory factor analysis. And we start with principal components analysis. As I explained before, Principal component analysis is a technique that rotates the data in space so that the largest amount of variance aligns with the first component, the second most amount of variance aligns with the second component, the third most amount of variance aligns with the third component, etc. These components are by definition uncorrelated. So even if we start with a couple of correlated predictors, they are rotated in such a way that the components resulting from the rotation become uncorrelated. We can use principal components analysis by following up our rotation with a second step where we drop some of the components that explain only little variance. We can also use this technique to investigate whether it's even possible to reduce a larger data set to a smaller number of components that explain the majority of the variance. Because it's just a data rotation technique, the results of principal components analysis can be directly calculated with simple matrix algebra, which is not covered in this course. So here we see a little visual demonstration of principal component analysis. Imagine that we collected people's scores on two variables, x1 here on the x-axis and x2 here on the y-axis. When we look at the pattern of data, these purple points, we immediately see that there is a linear association between x1 and x2. And we could use linear regression to predict x2 from x1, and then we would get this dotted red line here. But there's no point in using linear regression because x2 is not an outcome of x1. They are both indicators of the same unobserved latent variable. So instead of using linear regression, we're going to rotate these data. So what we do is we just pick up this whole data cloud here on the left and we rotate it so that the most variance is explained along one dimension, 
and the least amount of variance is explained along the second dimension. And then we call this first dimension that now explains the most variance, principal component one, and we call the second dimension that explains the least variance now, principal component two. So if you compare picture one with picture two, you will see it's the same data. It's just been rotated about 90 degrees. And now the majority of the variance is along the x-axis and a smaller amount of variance along the y-axis. So here on the bottom row, you see two other pictures that represent both variables just as a number line. So in the left picture, we see that x1 has a lot of variance along the number line and so does x2, right? So the people's points vary along both dimensions and that's before rotation. Now, after we rotate the data, we see that principal component one has a lot of variance along the number line, but principal component two has very little variance along the number line. And then if we want to reduce the dimensionality of these data, all we have to do is forget about principal component two and carry on our analyses using only principal component number one. And then we could say that principal component one explains most of the variance in both x1 and x2, and principal component two probably contained mostly error variance. So there are several ways in which you can understand principal component analysis. One way is the explanation I've just given, which is as a rotation of the data in space. The second way you can understand it is as a way to reproduce the original correlation matrix between items. And the first component already provides the best possible approximation of that correlation matrix. And adding each subsequent component results in a better reproduction of the original correlation matrix until you've included all of the components and then you can exactly reproduce the original correlation matrix. You can also think of it as a lower... You can also think of PCA as a lower dimensional representation of the data. So you can explain K items with fewer than K components. And you can think of it as a lossy compression of the data. So this last point is something that I wanted to illustrate in a visual way. Here's one of my passport photos on the right. So what I did here is I took my passport photo. That photo is an image with many pixels. Each pixel contains information about the colors red, blue and green. This image has 1875 rows and about 1200 columns. So I just imported that into SPSS. And then what I did is I conducted principal component analysis to extract 1000 components out of the original 1875 rows. And what you see is that the resulting picture I can reconstruct from the first 1000 components looks really beautiful, really high quality. But if I reduce the number of components, the picture in the middle here is constructed out of just 200 components from the original 1875 components. And we still get a recognizable image, like you still see that it's me, but some important information is lost, which is why I now have this green stain on my face. And if I go down even lower, I get just 10 components out of the original 1875 components then you see that a lot of information is lost. I get this very blocky picture with big color artifacts. But also notice, it's still identifiably a passport photo. I'm still clearly wearing a suit and tie. And if you know me, you might still recognize me. Even from a picture that is only constructed out of 10 components of the original 1875 components. In other words, you can see here that a lot of relevant information is retained when you drop some components out of your principal components analysis. When you apply this technique to questionnaire data, the same thing happens. You can still represent people's answering patterns pretty well, even with a lower number of components. So let's look at some questionnaire data for a moment. Here is data on six questions related to mental health in 300 participants. 
and it's represented as a correlation matrix. So we see the variables anxious, tense, restless, depressed, useless, and unhappy. Of course, anxious correlates perfectly with anxious, so the correlation on the diagonal is 1. But then we also see, for example, that anxious correlates moderately with tense, 0.45. And we see that anxious correlates pretty low with unhappy, 0.26, etc. So when we conduct principal component analysis, we start by representing this correlation matrix with an equal number of components as there were items. So we started with six items and now we will extract six components. We then rotate the data in space so that the component 1 explains the majority of the variance in these items component 2 explains the second most variance, etc. And then we can decide to drop components that do not explain much variance. So for example, you might decide to drop components 2 until 6 and keep just 1, or you might drop 3 until 6 and keep the first 2. You now have two components that explain the majority of the variance in your original 6 items. In other words, you've reduced the dimensionality of your data. So I keep saying that the first component explains the most variance, the second component the second most variance, etc. But exactly how much variance a component explains is expressed by the eigenvalue. The eigenvalue, often referred to as a lambda, reflects how much variance a component explains. Now think about it as follows. If we standardized all of our variables, then we could say that each variable contributes 100% explained variance, or one point of explained variance. So six items contribute in total six points of explainable variance. Our principal component analysis is going to explain the variance of all six of the items, so all of their eigenvalues must sum up to six again. In other words, the sum of all eigenvalues is equal to the number of items k. So the sum from item 1 until item k of the eigenvalue of that item will be equal to the number of items. And the proportion of explained variance in each item can be calculated by taking its eigenvalue lambda and dividing that by the total number of items. So we can get kind of an r square for each principal component that tells us how much of the variance in the items that component explains. As I mentioned before, if we want to use PCA for dimension reduction, one important challenge is to decide how many components we want to retain. There are several strategies to guide you. And the first strategy is known as Kaiser's Criterion. Kaiser's criterion simply states that you retain all of the components with an eigenvalue greater than 1. How can we interpret this rule of thumb? Well, we can interpret it as saying, I'm going to retain all of the items that explain more variance than just a single item's worth. This criterion may be objective, but it's highly influenced by the characteristics of your data set. So in many cases, it's actually not a good rule of thumb. Let's have a look at how many factors we would retain for the data that we used as an example if we took Kaiser's criterion. So here's a table where you see the eigenvalues of all six of the components. And we see that the first component has an eigenvalue of 2.81, the second one 0.93, then 0.79, etc. And of course the eigenvalues keep getting smaller because the first component explains the most variance, the second component, second most variance, etc. If we simply divide the column of eigenvalues by the number of items, then we get the proportion of total variance explained by each factor. So 2.8 divided by 6, that's almost 3 divided by 6, so that's close to 50%. So the first component explains 46.85% of the variance in all of the items. And the second, much lower, 15.5. The third, even lower, 13.19, etc. Of course, the variance explained by each of these components must ultimately add up to 100%. And if we keep a cumulative total of the explained variance for all of the items, then we indeed end up with 100%. There are other rules of thumb, however. 
And another one is Cattell's scree plot. A scree plot is just a graph with a number of components on the x-axis and their eigenvalues on the y-axis. And what you'll see is a curved line that levels off. We can use the elbow of this curved line, the point where it appears to bend, to guide our decision about the number of components to retain. Now this technique is subjective, but it's often very helpful and you can customize it a little bit more to the characteristics of the data set at hand. So here's a scree plot for the same example data. And what we see is that we start with one component that explains a lot of variance and then there's a big decrease. So the red dashed line here represents Kaiser's criterion. So if we followed Kaiser's criterion, we would only retain the first factor because that's the only one with an eigenvalue greater than one. And if we use the elbow criterion for the scree plot, then we would check where the plot bends. So I see it bending here around component two, and then you retain all factors above the bend. So here, the result from the scree plot would also be to retain just the first component. The third strategy, and arguably the best strategy, is Horn's parallel analysis, a technique developed in 1965. In this technique, what is done is you conduct many, many, many principal component analyses on random fake data. But crucially, these fake data have the same dimensionality as your original real data set. So the same number of cases and the same number of variables. And then you retain only the components from your real data set whose eigenvalue exceeds the 95th percentile of eigenvalues calculated based on fake data. So how can we interpret this? Well, we can interpret this as retaining all of the factors that have a higher eigenvalue than you would expect to see based on fake data with no structure. Horn's parallel analysis is the best data-driven strategy for selecting the number of components, but unfortunately it is not by default incorporated into SPSS, so you will have to download and use a script if you want to conduct this in SPSS. So here we have some output for Horn's parallel analysis. We again have a table with six rows for each of the six principal components. Each of them has an observed eigenvalue, and then we have the 95th percentile of eigenvalues calculated on randomly generated data. We're going to keep all of the components whose observed eigenvalue exceeds the 95th percentile of ones calculated on random data. And again, what we see is that only the first component has an observed eigenvalue that is greater than that 95th percentile, right? Already the second component has an observed eigenvalue of 0.93, but on randomly generated data we get eigenvalues of 1.15 for the second component. So in this example, all three of the decision criteria are in agreement. We should keep the first component. There is one more important decision criterion, and that is theory. If we have some relevant theoretical domain knowledge about the thing we're trying to measure, we can absolutely use that to guide our decision about how many dimensions to retain. So in this case, we measured mental health with six indicators, but I know that those six indicators relate to anxiety and depression. Those are two distinct dimensions. So it would be totally justifiable to say Regardless of those three data-driven decision techniques, I'm going to retain the first two components because I know that these data represent anxiety and depression, and I want to be able to capture both of those aspects. When we conduct principal component analysis, we obtain what's called a component matrix. It shows us basically correlations between each of the components I and each of the original items J. These correlations, of course, range from minus one to plus one, and they help us interpret what each of the components means. And to the extent that there is an interpretable structure in the data, these loadings help us interpret what each of the components means. So what we see in our current example is that the first principal component has very high associations with each of the original six items, and the lowest here is 0.62 and the highest is 
And the second component has very high associations with the first two and the final item, but note that the final item has a negative association with this component. And then we see for the third component, only this item has a high association with it, but this association is pretty strong but negative, etc. If we take these loadings and we square them, then the column sums of the squared loadings would add up to the eigenvalue of that component. So the column sum of the squared loadings of the first component would be equal to the first eigenvalue. In a similar way, we can calculate what is called the communality. And the communality is the row sum of the squared loadings for a particular item. And we can define the communality h square sub j as the proportion of variance in a particular item that is explained by m components. Because of course if we take all of the components then the communality will be 1. Because that one item is a linear combination of all of the components. If we keep all of the components the communality for that item will be 1. But if we decide to drop some components then the communality will be lower than 1. So the communality h square sub j for item j is calculated as the row sum of the squared loadings for m retained components. So if we keep m components, then the communality is calculated as a sum starting with the first component until the final component that we retain of the squared loadings of that item with that component. So when m is equal to the number of items k, of course the communality will be 1 because the components are just a rotation of the data. So if we keep all of the components, all of the data is exactly reproduced. So we can explain 100% of the variance. But when we drop some components, when m is smaller than the total number of items k, then the communality will also be smaller than 1. So here's an example of those communalities. Remember, they are the row sums of the squared component loadings. So if we were to add them up, we would get 1. 100% of the variance in this item is explained by all of the components. But if we drop some components, remember that for theoretical reasons, I decided to just keep two components. Then we see that the communality for this item is lower than 1, but it's still pretty high. With just two factors, I can still reproduce 73% of the variance in the variable anxious. And for some items, the communalities are a bit lower. With two components, I can reproduce only 50% of the variance in the item useless. The opposite of a communality is the unicity. The unicity is defined as the variance that is not explained by our M retained components. So again, if the number of retained components is equal to the number of items k, then we explain 100% of the variance, so the communality would be 1, and the unicity would be 1 minus the communality, so it would be 0. But if m is smaller than k, then the unicity is again 1 minus the communality. So below, the communality for the item anxious was 0.73, so the unicity of this item anxious is 1 minus 0.73 is 0.27. In other words, 0.27% of the variance in a variable anxious is not explained by the first two components. As I explained before, we can use a smaller number of components to try and reproduce the correlation between items. And we can define the reproduced correlation between two variables as the sum over components of the product of the unrotated loadings on those components. Let's say that we take the variables anxious and tense. To get the reproduced correlation between anxious and tense, or R with a hat on, the reproduced correlation R, then we take the loadings of these variables on the first component and multiply them. So anxious loads 0.67 on the first component and tense loads 0.62 on the first component, multiply 0.67 times 0.2, and we add the product of these items' loadings on the second component. So anxious loads 0.53 on the second component and tense loads 0.52, so 0.53 times 
and you add that to the product of the first two loadings. And if you have a third component, then you would also multiply the loadings of these two items on the third component and add that to the product of the loadings on the other two components. Using this method, we could reproduce the entire correlation matrix. Of course, it will slightly differ from the original observed correlation matrix between the items. So here is a reproduced correlation matrix for just two principal components. And on the diagonal, instead of having the correlation of the item with itself, which is always one, we've printed the communalities. So what we see here is that the reproduced correlations are pretty close to the original observed correlations, but of course, not perfect reproductions. To see how big the discrepancies are, we can ask for residual correlations. And those are simply the difference between the observed correlations and the reproduced correlations. So the residual correlations R resid are equal to the observed correlations minus the reproduced correlations R hat. So these are the differences. And what we see, for example, is that there's a pretty large difference between the reproduced correlation between tense and anxious and the original correlation, which was like 0.49, if I remember correctly. But some correlations are reproduced really well. For example, there's only a 0.01 difference between the reproduced correlation between anxious and unhappy and the observed correlation between them. If we increase the number of retained components, our reproduced correlations will be better. For example, remember that here there was a very big discrepancy. If we keep four components instead of just two, then we're going to have a much better reproduction of that original correlation of 0.45, but it's still not perfect. And of course, also note that the communalities on the diagonal get closer to one the more components we retain. So here we have the residual correlations for retaining four components. Notice that the discrepancy here is now much smaller, so this correlation is reproduced much better but there's a slight increase here. So it doesn't uniformly get better for all of the correlations. That's everything you need to know about principal component analysis. Now let's have a look at exploratory factor analysis. Again, we will use an example. In this case, we will use data on 12 items related to emotions in 117 individuals. So here's a correlation matrix, and we measured people's happiness, cheerfulness, pride, gratitude, love, sadness, jealousy, etc., etc. We can use exploratory factor analysis anytime we're comfortable assuming that there are latent variables that cause people's responses to the items. So exploratory factor analysis is a suitable technique when your theory implies the existence of some latent variables. Exploratory factor analysis tries to explain the covariances between items and unexplained variance is attributed to measurement error. This is very similar to test theory, which we covered last week. It's a suitable technique when you can assume that your observed item scores are a function of some true score plus measurement error. Exploratory factor analysis is particularly useful when you're using a questionnaire that has not been validated yet. So when you're developing a new questionnaire. If you're using a questionnaire that has already been validated, then it's more appropriate to use confirmatory factor analysis instead. What's different between exploratory factor analysis and PCA is that exploratory factor analysis is a latent variable technique. PCA is just data rotation. It only requires matrix algebra to rotate the data. But exploratory factor analysis is a model about latent variables. There are unknown parameters, namely the factor loadings and error variances, and these unknown quantities have to be estimated somehow. So here's a way to think of exploratory factor analysis. We assume that there is total variance in our items, and that total variance breaks down into common variance that can be explained by the latent variables and unique variance, which is attributed to error variance. We have at our disposal several distinct techniques for estimating those unknown model parameters. The first technique is principal axis factoring. This technique has long been considered the default method, particularly in the software SPSS. It's an iterative procedure with a basis in matrix algebra, 
and it is able to give a solution even when your model is too complex or your data are not normally distributed. So it's more robust to some violations of basic assumptions. But is that a good thing? Do we always need to get a result, even if our model is kind of too complex to get a reliable answer? A second way to estimate our model parameters is good old maximum likelihood. We also use this technique to estimate a logistic regression model, for example. Maximum likelihood is an estimator that we also used in the lecture about logistic regression to estimate our model parameters there. And it's also the default estimator for people who use confirmatory factor analysis. Maximum likelihood tends to work well when your data are multivariate normal distributed, but it does not work well when your model is too complex to arrive at a reliable solution. But maximum likelihood has one major advantage. Unlike principal access factoring, it actually estimates a model and therefore it gives you a test of model fit. So you can use maximum likelihood not only to estimate your model, but also to estimate how well that model fits the data. When we perform exploratory factor analysis, we get something very similar to the component matrix from principal components analysis. We get a matrix of what are called factor loadings. Sometimes this is called the factor matrix. What this shows us are the correlations between the items and the factors. So let's say that we extracted two factors from our 12 items. Then we would see, for example, that the item happy correlates 0.11 with the first factor, which is pretty low. But the item jealous correlates 0.61 with the first factor, which is pretty high. And then if we look at the big picture, we see that negative emotions, sad, jealous, worry and stress, all load higher on the first factor than positive emotions like happy, cheerful, gratitude and love. And then for the second factor, we see pretty high correlations for the positive emotions, happy, cheerful, gratitude and love, but low or even negative correlations for some of the negative emotions. So already it looks like these two components are able to kind of pull apart positive from negative emotions. Because these factor loadings are correlations, they also range from minus one to plus one. We can still get a sort of eigenvalues for exploratory factor analysis. And just like before, these are the column sums of squared loadings on the factor. But note that these eigenvalues are different from the ones for principal component analysis. Principal component analysis is just a rotation of the items. So 12 items are represented with 12 components. And for that reason, all of the eigenvalues must add up to the number of components, which was 12. But exploratory factor analysis allows for measurement error. So it assumes that some information will be lost because it's measurement error. And for that reason, the eigenvalues will always add up to a lower number than the total number of items because measurement error is taken out of it. Also note that for exploratory factor analysis, eigenvalues can be negative. And the values you get are no longer deterministic as they were in PCA. Instead, they depend on the number of factors that you extract. So what we see here is very simply the column sum of the squared loadings for factor one and factor two. And we see that those are 3.09 and 2.06. And we see that both of those are smaller than the eigenvalues obtained through PCA, which were 3.65 and 2.54 and the difference is due to measurement error. How can we determine the number of factors when we use exploratory factor analysis? Well, if we want to use data-driven strategies, we run into a challenge, which is that the eigenvalues depend on the number of factors extracted. So one thing that's very commonly done is that people take their cue for the number of factors to retain based on the eigenvalues of a PCA. So they might consider Kaiser's criterion and the scree plot for PCA, even to determine the number of factors to retain in EFA. You can also use Horn's parallel analysis, but there are two challenges. One is that it's not implemented in SPSS by default. And the second is that the solution changes depending on the chosen number of factors. But remember that we can also use theoretical knowledge to determine the number of factors. 
And this becomes even more salient when we use a model-based technique like exploratory factor analysis. In this example, we used 12 items to measure emotions, and I theorize that those 12 emotions break down into a set of positive emotions and a set of negative emotions, so we should extract two factors to capture those positive and negative emotions. As I mentioned before, when you use maximum likelihood to extract your factor solution, you can obtain a chi-square test of model fit. How can we interpret this test? Well, a significant test means that the model implied correlation matrix significantly differs from the observed correlation matrix. In other words, if your chi-square test is significant, you have a bad model. You can use this chi-square test to evaluate a theoretical model. Remember that I theorized that this set of 12 emotions would break down into two factors, one for positive and one for negative emotions. But if I look at the chi-square test, I observe a chi-square value on 43 degrees of freedom of 81.12 with a p-value smaller than 0.001. In other words, there is significant misfit between the reproduced correlation matrix and the observed correlation matrix. So our model is a little bad. Aside from conducting a chi-square test of model fit, you can also calculate what are known as fit indices, numbers that express how well your model fits the data. One very common model fit index is the BIC, short for Bayesian Information Criterion. This is a relative model fit index that balances how well the model fits the data with the complexity of the model. Because you can imagine that any model will fit the data better if you make it more complex. If it gets really complex, it will fit the data really well. So what the BIC does is it applies a penalty for model complexity to the model fit, allowing you to find the model that has the perfect balance between necessary complexity and elegant simplicity. Another way to think about this is that the BIC prefers simple models that have good enough fit to the data. BIC is not on any meaningful scale, so there is no absolute cutoff but you can use it to compare different models estimated on the same data set and choose the one with the lowest BIC value. How can you calculate the BIC? Well, first you perform exploratory factor analysis with maximum likelihood estimation for all of the solutions that you want to compare. For example, one factor, two factor or three factor solutions. You write down the chi-square values in a spreadsheet and then for each model, you calculate the degrees of freedom. And the degrees of freedom are k minus m squared minus k plus m divided by 2, where k is the number of items and m is the number of factors. And then for each model, you can calculate the BIC as follows. It's the chi-square value minus the degrees of freedom times the log of the sample size. So here's a little table that I calculated for our example data. Remember that we had 117 participants and 12 emotion indicators. I estimated a 1, 2 and 3 factor solution. And what we see is that the simplest model with just one factor has the highest chi-square. Because it's the simplest model, it must have the greatest misfit to the data but it also has the largest degrees of freedom, which means that it's the simpler model. And then if we look at a more complex model, for example, the two-factor model, that one has lower misfit to the data with a chi-square of 81.12, but it also has fewer degrees of freedom because it's a more complex model. And a three-factor model is the most complex out of the set. It has the lowest misfit to the data. So the misfit is 46.28, but it also has fewer degrees of freedom. It only has 33 degrees of freedom. So if we made our decision purely based on fit, then we would choose the model that has the least misfit out of this set. But if we let our decision be guided by the BIC, then we actually balance fit and complexity. And what we see is that model two strikes the optimal balance between fit and complexity because it has the lowest BIC.
We can make our model more complex by adding another factor, but that doesn't weigh up against the increase in complexity. So we actually get a higher BIC for the more complex model and a much higher BIC for the simplest model. And the two-factor model strikes the optimal balance between fit and complexity. So you can use the BIC to choose the best model out of a set. But there's another challenge, which is how complex can I make my model for a particular data set? The problem is that in order to have an identified model, that is a model with a mathematical solution, you must have fewer model parameters than observed data points. And the solution is that you can use the degrees of freedom to determine a maximum number of factors that you could extract. A model with fewer than zero degrees of freedom could not be estimated with maximum likelihood because it's not identified. Although it remains possible to extract some solution using other methods, remember that I mentioned principal axis factoring before, such a model is likely too complex for the data. So you should be skeptical about how much stock to put in its results. So here we see that for a one factor model, we would have 54 degrees of freedom. For a two factor model that decreases to 43. For a three factor model, it goes down to 33. And if we go up to a seven factor model, we would only have three degrees of freedom left. And if we add even more factors, we end up with negative degrees of freedom. And those are all models that do not have an identified solution if we use maximum likelihood estimation. So if we let ourselves be guided by the degrees of freedom, we could say that we can estimate up to seven factors on this data set and anything with more factors becomes too complex to estimate. Let's look at communalities and unicity for exploratory factor analysis. Remember that the communality h square sub j is the proportion of variance in an item accounted for by the m factors that we extract. In PCA, we can always explain 100% of the variance in items if we use all of the components. So the communality, if we use all components, will be one. But for EFA, we can never explain 100% of the variance in items because there is assumed to be measurement error. So in EFA, communalities are always smaller than one because of error variance. And that means that the unicity, which is one minus the communality, will always be bigger than zero. When we estimate an EFA model, the initial estimate of communalities is the squared multiple correlation coefficient with all of the other items. And this is the R square, it's a squared correlation, so it's a measure of explained variance. When we conduct EFA in SPSS, it will report something called an initial communality estimate, and this is actually the squared multiple correlation coefficient of an item with all other items. So that's a measure of R square or explained variance. But note that this initial communality actually has nothing to do with the EFA model. It's just a squared multiple correlation. Now we've covered the two main techniques for dimension reduction, PCA and EFA. But if we want to interpret the results from such analyses, we can make our lives a lot easier by rotating the solution as well. So let's say we want to interpret the pattern of factor loadings from either PCA or EFA. And we want to determine whether there are any items that load highly on only one factor. We can even try to name our factors based on which items load highly on them. And this relates to the validity of constructs because what we want to see is that all of the relevant items for one construct load on the same factor. We can interpret the loadings both for PCA and for EFA. So in a perfect world, we would love to see a loading table like this. In this case, we have two factors, factor one and factor two, and we have all of our items and we see zero factor loadings for some items on the first factor and perfect loadings for those same items on the second factor. And then for different items, we see perfect loadings on the first factor and zero loadings on the second factor. In this perfect world, we could just say factor two measures all of the positive emotions and factor one measures all of the negative emotions. But real life is messier. So here is the loading matrix 
from our real data. And what we see, for example, is that for the item happy, the loading is pretty high on factor two, but it's not zero for factor one. And for the second item, cheerful, the picture is even more ambiguous. The loading on the first factor is almost 0.4, and the loading on the second factor is almost 0.7. So in the real world, it looks like factor A might measure the negative emotions, but what about cheerful that has a pretty high loading on both? And what about pride that actually has a pretty low loading on both of the factors? And is factor two positive emotions? We don't see all of the positive emotions loading that highly on there. Interesting. And like I mentioned, we can also try to interpret our loadings from PCA. So for our PCA example with five mental health related symptoms, let's interpret a two component solution. So what we see is that all of the items actually load pretty high on the first component. And then on the second component, we see high loadings for just the first two, but we see a high negative loading for the last one. So how do we make sense of this? Do we say that the first component represents all mental health symptoms and the second component represents maybe a bit of anxiety and low unhappiness? It's confusing. To ease our interpretation of these loading matrices, we can rotate them. So what is rotation? Well, just like PCA rotates the raw data, we can also rotate the loading matrix of either PCA or EFA until the pattern of loadings becomes easier to interpret. So rotation simplifies and improves the interpretability of the loadings. It applies a linear transformation to the original loadings. And the goal of this transformation is to obtain high loadings for each item on only one factor. Thus, rotation reduces cross loadings. There are two types of rotation that you should be familiar with. And the first is orthogonal rotation. Orthogonal rotation means that the resulting components or factors are not correlated with each other. The factors are distinct, they are independent, and high loadings on one factor are not associated with high loadings on another factor. The most common algorithm for orthogonal rotation is what's called Verimax rotation. Verimax rotation maximizes the variance of the squared loadings within each factor. And that means that loadings are either very high or very low with little in between. So here's a demonstration of Verimax rotation on our five mental health symptoms. Imagine we extract a two principal component solution. And here on the X axis now we see the loading on principal component one. And remember that loading can go from minus one to plus one. And here on the Y axis, we see the loading of each item on the second principal component. So in the original unrotated interpretation of this pattern of loadings, we see that unhappy loads about 0.75 on the first component and about minus 0.5 on the second component. And if you look at this figure, you see a red axis system. That's the original axis system along which the loadings are interpreted. Now you could imagine taking that axis system and just rotating it until some items have really high loadings on one of the axes and other items have really high loadings on the other axis. And if we do that, it turns out that the optimal rotation is this blue axis system here. And now we see that anxious and tense have extremely high loadings on this dimension here. And the others have pretty high loadings on this second dimension here. So after rotation, the rotated component loadings look like this. We now see that restless, depressed, useless, and unhappy all load pretty high on the rotated first component. And we see that anxious and tense and restless all load pretty highly on the second rotated component. So now most of the ambiguity is gone, except for the item restless. This is much easier to interpret. The second type of rotation is what's called oblique rotation. And oblique rotation means that factors are now allowed to be correlated. That means that it's possible for high loadings of items on one factor to be associated with high loadings of items on a different factor. Back in the day, 
Everybody tended to use Verimax rotation, but nowadays it's more commonly accepted that in the social sciences, many of the things we want to measure are correlated. For example, if there are five personality dimensions, it makes total sense that they will be associated. Similarly, if we're measuring anxiety and depression, it makes total sense that those will be correlated. So nowadays, oblique rotation that allows for such correlations is much more common. When we're interpreting the results of an oblique rotation, it is very important to keep in mind that after oblique rotation, the loadings are no longer interpretable as correlations. Instead, we can get two types of output. One type of output is called the pattern matrix, and the pattern matrix displays the rotated factor loadings. You can interpret each row of the pattern matrix as a regression equation, describing how the standardized item is calculated as a function of all of the different factors, plus measurement error if you're using EFA. Of course, not if you're using PCA. So for example, let's imagine we have two factors. Then we interpret the first row of the pattern matrix as saying that item X1 is a linear function of the loading of item one with factor one times the score on factor one plus the loading of item one with factor two times the score on factor two plus measurement error. So in the pattern matrix, each loading is a regression coefficient controlled for the effect of all of the other items. The second type of output we can obtain is called the structure matrix. And the structure matrix shows us the bivariate correlations between the items and factors. In other words, it shows us the correlation coefficient R of X1, item one, with factor one, F1. And these correlations in the structure matrix are not controlled for all of the other items. So here's a picture that shows oblique rotation in the same way that we previously showed orthogonal rotation. Remember that in orthogonal rotation, we started with an axis system and we only rotated it, and that made sure that our factors or components remained uncorrelated. Well, in oblique rotation, we're going to allow for correlation. And that means that we don't just rotate the axes, but we also allow them to get closer together. That's called a shear transformation. So what we see here is that we start with a blue axis system, and when we apply oblique rotation, not only do those axes rotate to the right to get the red solution here, but they also get closer together, introducing a correlation between those two factors. And this allows us to capture anxious and tense with one factor, and restless, depressed, useless, and unhappy with another factor. Notice that these four items are much closer to their own dimension now, but in order to get that, we had to allow for correlation between the dimensions. So if we interpret the pattern matrix of the oblique rotated solution, we see that there is one principal component here with high loadings of restless, depressed, useless, and unhappy. This loading is notably smaller, and we have a second component where anxious and tense load highly, and the ambiguity of this item is much smaller now. So when you conduct your own research, which type of rotation should you use? Well, the choice depends on theory and your research goals. If you're trying to reduce multicollinearity among several predictors in regression, then you might want to use orthogonal rotation because that does not allow for correlation between the components. If you're constructing a scale of different dimensions that are probably going to be correlated, you might want to use oblique rotation. And in this example of anxiety and depression, it makes a lot of sense that those two mental health symptoms would be correlated, so we should use oblique rotation. Of course, when we use oblique rotation, we allow factors or components to be correlated, so we should report what those correlations are. So in this example, with anxiety and depression, the rotated components are correlated 0.4, which is a moderate correlation. Let me just give you a word of warning. Remember that I mentioned that rotated loadings can no longer be interpreted as correlations of the item with a factor. Principal component analysis is a specific rotation of the data, and there is only one PCA solution for every data set, 
and that solution can exactly reproduce the original data. If we rotate that solution, however, we lose those appealing properties. There's no solution to this, but the only advice I can give you is to always clearly report in your papers that you followed up PCA with a rotation. Because EFA is a statistical model, there are several assumption checks that we could do to see whether this model is appropriate. One assumption is that multicollinearity is not too high. This is kind of paradoxical because we use dimension reduction techniques when we do expect that our items are all associated. But paradoxically, the model breaks down if the items are too strongly associated, especially when some items are perfectly linearly dependent. That means if you can perfectly reproduce the score on one item from the scores on other items. The reason this causes problems is that it becomes impossible to determine the unique contribution of each item to the model. How do we check for multicollinearity when doing EFA? Well, we can use what's called the determinant of the data set. SPSS gives this to us by default. And what we're looking for is a determinant between 0.00001 and 1. But note that the size of the determinant depends on the number of items. If you have many items, the determinants tend to be smaller. A second criterion that we can check is the kaiser meyer olkin statistic or the KMO statistic. And it is an estimate of the proportion of common variance among items. If there's a higher proportion of common variance, then factor analysis is more appropriate. And here are some rules of thumb that accompany the KMO statistic. Remember that I told you that there are three techniques and I would discuss only the first two, PCA and EFA? Well, I still want to talk to you just a little bit about confirmatory factor analysis. And for the following reason. If your theory implies a one-factor solution, then EFA with maximum likelihood estimation is the same as confirmatory factor analysis. And this is very cool because if you're developing a questionnaire that's only supposed to measure one dimension, like extraversion, you can just use this off-the-shelf solution that's built into SPSS to conduct your confirmatory factor analysis and determine how good your scale is. Specifically, what you can do is you can extract a one-factor solution and use the chi-square test to determine if your model fits the data well. But there's a limitation of this chi-square test. Specifically, it's very sensitive to sample size. So you quickly end up with a significant chi-square test and would conclude that your model does not fit the data well, even though your model's pretty good. So alternatively, what you can do is you can calculate what's called the RMSEA. That's a model fit index that accounts for sample size. And values smaller than 0.08 are considered to be good. So if you have an RMSEA smaller than 0.08, even if your chi-square test of model fit is significant, you may still have a pretty good fitting model. How do we calculate the RMSEA? We start with the chi-square value, minus the degrees of freedom of the model, and take the square root of that, and divide that by the square root of the number of participants minus 1 times the degrees of freedom. So it's a pretty simple calculation. Another cool trick that we can do with one-factor exploratory factor analysis models is we can calculate latent variable reliability instead of Kronbach's alpha. Recall that Kronbach's alpha had this one unrealistic assumption that all of the items would be equally indicative of the underlying construct. As you saw in all of the examples today, this assumption is regularly violated because the factor loadings can vary substantially, they're definitely not all the same. So while Kronbach's alpha assumes that all of the factor loadings are the same, factor analysis allows us to test that assumption. And we can go one step further and calculate latent variable reliability, which allows for differences in the size of factor loadings. This latent variable reliability is called McDonald's Omega, or sometimes composite reliability. And we can calculate Omega by taking the sum of squared loadings divided by the sum of squared loadings plus the sum of squared residuals. So how do we get the sum of squared loadings? Well, we first sum all of the loadings for a particular factor and then square the sum 
And how do we calculate the sum of squared residuals? Well, we first square all of the loadings, then sum them, and then take one minus that sum. The last new topic that I want to introduce today are scale scores. You've previously learned two types of scale scores. The first were sum scores, which are simply calculated as the sum of people's scores across all of the items. And that means that people's scores on each of the items are equally weighted. So you can imagine as each of those scores being multiplied with one. You've also learned about mean scores, and mean scores are simply the sum of people's item scores divided by the number of items. And that is the same as weighting people's scores on each of the items equally, so multiplying them by one, and then dividing the sum by the number of items. But crucially, in both of these approaches, all of the items contribute equally. They're all multiplied by one. They have equal weights. But we can also use PCA to get scores. And to get PCA scores, we multiply the standardized item scores for all of the J items with the J factor loadings. And that allows us to calculate a weighted sum score. So for example, if we have factor loadings 0.85, 0.80 and 0.14 and one of our students and one of our participants Francis has standardized scores of 1, 3 and 2 on the variables that have these loadings then we can simply calculate 0.85 times 1 plus 0.80 times 3 plus 0.14 times 2 and divide that by the sum of the squared factor loadings to get a score of 2.44 on this component. So the important thing to notice here is that Francis's score on each of the variables is multiplied by a different weight to account for the fact that those different variables contribute differentially to that component. In PCA, of course, people's scores are uniquely determined because the factor solution is just a rotation of the data. With EFA, however, we run into the problem that there's not one uniquely determined solution, so also there is not one uniquely determined set of factor scores on the unobserved latent variables. So although we can estimate the EFA model that does not tell us what the latent variable score for every single individual would have been, it just tells us the overall properties of the latent variables. Because an infinite number of latent variable data sets are consistent with the same resulting EFA model. Now there are some methods to estimate what an individual's score on latent variables could have been, but that's just a guess, it's not deterministic, and at best those factor scores tell us a person's relative level on the latent factor. So we can use them to get some sense of whether a person scored higher or lower, but we don't know with certainty that that was their latent variable score. So how can we obtain factor scores in EFA? Well, one approach is the regression method, and this gives us an ordinary least squares estimate of people's factor scores that maximizes the multiple correlation between the factor score and the common factors. But it's known that these scores obtained by the regression method are biased estimates of the true factor score. Even when we do orthogonal EFA, the regression scores for different factors are correlated with each other and with all latent factors. And that doesn't make sense, right? Because orthogonal EFA should result in uncorrelated factors. But if we use the regression method to estimate people's scores, we get correlated factors out of that. That doesn't make sense. Another method is Bartlett's method. If we use Bartlett's method, then factor scores only correlate with their own latent factor, but they still correlate with the estimated scores for the other factors. So there's still some correlation introduced where it shouldn't be. Because of all of these limitations, some have argued that if the factor loadings are approximately equal, it may be better to avoid all of these problems and just compute the mean scores instead. And if you want to read more about that, here are two references that you can check out. So now we've covered all of the material for today, but I can imagine that if you want to apply this in future research, you might benefit from some simple steps to follow. So here are some simple steps for data reduction. The first step is you're going to have to choose a model. Are you using PCA, 
So there's no theoretical reason to assume that there would be latent variables. Or are you using EFA? You think there are latent variables, but you don't necessarily know what they are. Or are you using CFA? There are latent variables and you know what they are. Which of these use cases best fits your theory and goals for the analysis? The second question is, which estimator are you going to use? If it's PCA, there's only one solution, it's just rotating the data. If you're using EFA, I would argue that the best solution is maximum likelihood, because that allows you to test model fit, calculate model fit indices, and treat a single factor model as a CFA model. The second step is to check your assumptions. First, is your sample large enough? For example, it's generally recommended that you have a pretty large sample for EFA, at least 150, but ideally more than 300. Second, all of these methods just account for linear association between items. So you might want to check bivariate scatter plots to see whether the associations are even linear to begin with. Third, as always, you would report descriptive statistics and item correlations. And then if you're doing EFA, you would additionally report the determinant and the KMO statistic. And for the determinant, you're looking for a value that is between 0 0.0001 and 1. And for the KMO statistic, you're looking for a value that exceeds 0.60. The third step is to determine how many factors you want to extract. Now, the most important criterion to determine the number of factors is theory, especially for theoretically driven models like EFA and CFA. But there are also some data-driven approaches. For example, you can use Kaiser's criterion or the scree plot. And for both of those, you would use the eigenvalues obtained from PCA, even if you're using this decision criterion to determine the number of factors in EFA. A better solution is parallel analysis, and this is valid for both PCA and EFA. And a final consideration is, are the results of your chosen number of factors or components even interpretable? So interpretability is another valid consideration. The next step is to check the fit of your model. Check how much variance each of the factors or components explains. How well do the factors explain the variance of the items? So check the communalities of each item. Does every item have a sufficient amount of explained variance? Check the residual correlations. If there are many large residual correlations, for example, larger than 0.05, then there might be a problem with those items, or it might be better to add factors so that you can better reproduce the correlation matrix. If you're using EFA, you can optionally conduct a chi-square test of model fit. If you have a one-factor EFA model, you can treat it as if it were a CFA model and calculate an objective fit measure, namely the RMSEA. And if you have multiple EFA models with different number of factors, you can calculate the BIC for each of those models and choose the one with the lowest BIC. The next step is interpreting the results of your solution so you can look at the pattern of loadings and see if you can come up with relevant names for each of the factors based on the pattern of loadings. You could generally ignore loadings that are smaller than 0.3 to help interpretation. And if the first solution does not seem readily interpretable, you can additionally consider rotating the solution to aid interpretability. If you want to get orthogonal factors, for example, because you want to avoid multicollinearity, then you would use an orthogonal Varimax rotation. And if you want to allow for correlations between the factors, then you can use an oblique rotation, specifically Oblimin rotation. Of course, if you do use Oblimin rotation, you then have to report the correlation coefficients between factors. And the final step, step five, is optionally calculate scale scores to use in onward analyses. Ideally, you would then also calculate the latent variable reliability, or McDonald's Omega. And you can use a different method for calculating the scores, depending on if you used PCA, then you can just calculate them. And if you used EFA, you have to choose between the regression method or Bartlett's method. Both of those have shortcomings. So if your factor loadings are approximately equal for all of the items that load on that factor, you could even consider just using mean scores instead.
I know that was a lot of ground to cover and that's why there are two weeks in the schedule for you to really go over this material thoroughly, apply it to the tutorial material and apply it to your portfolio assignment to really integrate it. If you're a social science student, this is also our last session together for this course. I hope you enjoyed it and that it may be of value to you in the rest of your career. All the best to you.